Hi, I'm Robert James, and welcome to the International School of Gemology's Journey Through Gemology. In this edition, we're going to be talking about diamond grading. The diamond grading essentials. We're going to talk about the protocols, procedures, and some pitfalls that you may run into. Now, this is an outreach we have from the ISG for those who want to know, know more about diamond grading and gemology as we move through other editions. And perhaps you're not ready to study with a school. Maybe you're in a study and you need some really some a little bit more personal explanation of what's going on. And that's what the journey through gemology here is all about. So I want to take just a minute to let you know, first thing, we're here in our lab in our office. We don't try to put together some fancy backdrop here. You're looking at all the specimens and things that we teach with and develop course notes and all of our tools and techniques that we have back here come from the actual gemological equipment that you see behind me. Now, just to let you know who I am, just because you, some of me, some of you may not have any idea of uh, of who I am and who the ISG is, I will just tell you that the um, I hold a, a fellow. I'm a fellow of the Gemological Association of Great Britain. In fact, the ISG was originally an Allied Teaching Center of the British Association, and I am a fellow. And I used to teach the uh, FGA program. I have also held the Certified Gemologist Diploma from the American Gem Society. I'm a graduate gemologist of the GIA. Additionally, I hold a business law certification from Cornell Law School, as well as a higher education teaching certificate from Harvard University. In addition to this, I, since I worked for USAA for a number of years, I maintain my license as a state licensed property and casualty insurance adjuster with the Texas Department of Insurance and by reciprocity, although all across the United States and have done that for a number of years, specializing in high value jewelry claims. So I wanted just to give you an introduction of who we are, what we're doing, who I am, and a welcome to you into this first edition of the ISG Journey Through Gemology. Now let's talk about diamonds. Let's talk about diamond grading. What we're going to want to do first, let's talk and see what diamonds are. In other, in other words, let's look at some diamonds and see what the diamonds look like before we start getting them cut and we start being able to grade them. And to do that, I've got a little short video here that I think is going to be interesting for you. And it'll give you an idea of what diamonds actually look like before they're cut and what the difference is between gem quality diamonds and what we might call industrial diamonds. I want to take just a minute and give you a video look at the different diamond qualities. There's This isn't really so much all the diamond shapes because you know there's cubes and everything else. But here, here we have a two and a half carat rough diamond and it's just a big chunk of diamond, obviously broken off a much bigger crystal. But you can see there's not a really good shape to it. It's been broken there on the edge. And there's a lot of the diamonds that are found that are going to look just like this. The gem quality diamonds are generally in this shape, but you can see that this really is a gem quality. This this has the atri octahedral attributes. It's got the shape of an octahedral, but it's so heavily included that you couldn't be used for anything as a gem quality diamond. It's more of an industrial, but it's a nice shape, so we can use it for teaching. Here we have the gem quality, and this actually was very expensive because obviously they wanted to cut it and get a, a finished faceted diamond out of it rather than selling it to me as a crystal. But it shows you how perfect the crystals can grow. And this is the type of crystal that they have to find to be able to facet this into a finished diamond. But this is a gem quality octahedral. This is what your gem, gem quality diamonds will look like, even though the vast majority of them are going to look like the others. But I thought this would be a good video demonstration to show you exactly the differences and show you just how special the gem quality octahedral diamonds really are. That gives you an idea of what diamonds look like before they get to the jewelry pipeline and get faceted and cut and gives you an idea of what the, the diamonds are all about. The interesting thing about this, though, when we get into diamond grading and diamond grading essentials, we need to cross an issue first. And, and for this, I want to show you just something very briefly here, um, because it's a, it's a headline that is of great importance to 
the industry and and what you're looking at here and sorry about that i took this as a screenshot off of uh, jck retailer faces more lawsuits over egl international reports and this was a big conflict in the industry not terribly long ago just a few years ago because egl which is a, a famous lab european gemological laboratory in israel was grading diamonds for color and face table up Okay, you're going to learn that diamonds should be colored or color graded with the table down. But this particular lab was grading table up. And of course, the diamonds graded higher because table up, you don't see the color so much. You're going to learn about this in a minute. But there's a, the reason I'm getting to this. I was actually expert witness on this particular case. And believe it or not, I was defending EGL Israel. I was asked to, to defend them. And it was not terribly difficult because what this was based on was everybody trying to say, well, you have to grade according to GIA grading standards. And I actually went to the deposition and the lawyers were like, you know, aren't you a GI graduate geologist? And I said, yes, I am. Don't you agree that EGL should be using, you know, the GIA grading scale? And I was like, I don't know what it is. And they were like, what? Then they said, well, don't you agree that they're overgrading their diamonds because they're not using the GIA standards? And I was like, GIA doesn't have any standards. If you have a standard set, please put it on the table. I'll look at it. They have nomenclature. They have levels of categories, but they don't have actual standards of what qualifies as an SI1 or what qual qualifies as a VS1. There's no actual standards. The reason this came up and the reason I show you this and what I start with on this, EGL Israel did not lose this. They actually had to settle it out because the situation came up and what actually happened was there are no standards for diamond grading and there was nothing to keep EGL Israel from grading the diamonds with the table up. And they didn't do anything wrong because there's no standards, there's no oversight. I only bring this to you because you need to understand this if you're in the diamond markets or getting into diamond or getting into diamond grading because there are no industry standards. The GIA invented a nomenclature, a levels of classification but what justifies that classification to be there, there's nothing about that. So you need to keep that in mind, it's subjective. And your diamond grading that you do, if you learn particularly the guidelines that we're gonna show you here, you'll find yourself being in the mainstream with what the industry accepts and you'll understand better what's going on. This may be a little in depth for those of you that are just getting started, but it's important to know, because you hear this all the time, GIA certified diamond. GI doesn't certify diamonds or, you know, graded to GI standards. There are no standards. So you need to understand this. And the grading from one lab to the next can be very different. And it's all okay because there's no standard. With that said, let's take a look at this next section, which is going to be cut grading. And I want to start off talking about cut grading of diamonds because when a diamond is cut, the shape of a diamond was actually mathematically created by a gentleman named Tokowski. And he created it for a very specific reason that I wanna show you right now in this little short video, because this is gonna be very important. Here's a fun demonstration gizmo that the GIA actually sold many, many years ago. I don't know, it's been 45, 50 years ago that they sold this. This is a great little demonstration tool about diamond cut grading and how important it is that diamonds be cut to proper proportions. And what we have is a light source here. And what is these little plastic cutouts of a gemstone? But the way the light interacts, it's a very realistic demonstration of how light acts in a cut stone. And you can see in this stone that's being shown here, this stone is too shallow. And look where the light goes. This actually shows the reflections and refractions of the light in a stone that's cut too shallow. And this is what happens in a diamond that's cut too thin. If they're cut too shallow, you lose the light. And in this next one, it is a diamond that's cut too thin. Thick. It's cut too deep. And look at what the light does. You lose it. It's light leakage. This is where the term light leakage comes from. It's what you're seeing here. And you're actually seeing this is a real light beam going into these little scientific demonstration pieces that we have. And you can see how the light is lost in a diamond that's cut too deep. It could be a D flawless. It could be the finest D flawless in the world. But if it's cut too deep, it's not going to be brilliant. 
now we're going to go to a stone that's cut properly. And look at this. No matter where the light goes in, it goes out the top. And that's the concept of an ideal cut diamond. These are the mathematical equations as far as how these facets are positioned that Tok Tokowski was working on. And you can see the results of this here because no matter where the light goes into the diamond, it comes out the top. And that's the concept of an ideal cut diamond. That's the concept of why cut grading is the most important grade when you consider diamond value. thought this was a fun thing. That is a good, that's a good explanation of what's going on as far as with the diamond cut. Now, the key is how do you evaluate that cut? How do you as a jeweler or a gemologist, an appraiser, a dealer, how do you evaluate that cut? And that comes into making measurements and understanding those measurements. And for that, I've got something else that I want you to see right quick because it's another very important video to demonstrate it for you. When you evaluate your diamond for proportioning, remember that your first measurement is going to be from the table to the culet. That's going to be your depth, and that becomes your depth percentage. And you're going to use that number when figuring the proportions for the rest of the diamond. So we be very careful when you're measuring this that you're doing so in this manner. When measuring the diameter of the stone, remember that no diamond is going to be completely round. They are not perfectly round, so you need to get an average, and you're going to be needing to do measurements from all the way around the stone to be sure that you get an average the diameter of the stone. And for that reason, as you're going to see here, you're going to have to rotate the stone as you're measuring it and measure from different locations of the diameter. And as you do that, you're going to get several readings and then you'll take a average, you'll take an average of those readings to be able to get the diameter of the stone. And then when you're measuring for the table, remember to go from the point to the point as you see here. You're going to want to go from the facet junction area and not from the facets themselves because this is going to be the proper area and the, and the proper location to be measuring for your table size. What you don't want to do is with the arrow with the little X on it, measuring to the facet size itself, that will not be the correct area to be measuring from. As you can see from the other arrow, you're going to be want to measure from the facet junction. This is the proper way to be measuring your diamond for evaluation of your proportioning. Now remember something. We're going to be doing the diamond grading in order of importance, which is cut, color, and clarity. The reason is with a well-cut stone, you can have a stone that's got inclusions in it, but if it's well-cut, as you saw from the demonstration, it's going to have a lot of brilliance. But even a D-flawless diamond that's not cut properly will be dead, just not look good if it's not cut properly. That's the reason that cut is such an important part of what, of what, we're, what we're working on and what we're doing. Now, there is... Um, something else here that I want to show you. There, there's a couple of things right quick that I want you to keep in mind when you're doing this, this grading. And the first part about this is watch how you use the loop. The loop has got to be up to your eye, put the stone up, and this is the proper way to be able to use the loop. Don't hold it down on the stone or anything else. One of the ways we can tell that someone is a novice is because they're holding a loop down and not up to their eye. Second thing is be careful about the holders you're using to hold the diamond. Don't use those locking tweezers. There's tweezers that like, they'll look like what you see here, but they have a slide lock on them. Don't do that because diamonds can break with those. And the other thing is diamond papers. And that's something that's very important for you as a professional is to know how to open and close the diamond paper. And that's something I want to show you right here because the, with the diamond paper, uh, I have students that I'll send diamonds to and they get, they get sent this and it comes back just wadded up. You have to be able to know how to unfold and fold diamond papers without looking at it. It's the mark. If, you, if somebody hands you a stone and a diamond paper and you open it and then you start fumbling around with trying to close it, they're going to know you haven't been at this very long. You need to get some diamond papers in practice. You got to be able to do it with your eyes closed. 
And that sometimes can be a problem, but once you learn it, it comes without even thinking about it. Now, I want you to I want to want to show you one more thing important about diamond cut grading, and that's the use of a sarin. And I've always called it sarin because I've used one for 30 years, but they have changed the name to serene. I believe S-A-R-I-N-E. And the reason being, when you searched sarin, you got the sarin gas. OK, and they didn't like being searched on Google like that. So they changed the name some. But that's just, you know, kind of a side point. But let me just let, let's just take a look at, at this for just a minute, because when we see this. This is the sarin unit, and this is how the professionals will be measuring diamonds. And what this is from where the little red arrow is here, the diamond goes into that little platform and the red door will close. Once that is there, you, you can hit go with this. And this is what the silhouette looks like. And I have to thank John Roberts and, and, um, and Janelle John Thomas Mead, John, sorry, John Thomas Mead and Janelle for helping us get this, this Saren. I've got so much going on, it's kind of hard to keep it all straight. At any rate, um, John Thomas and Janelle helped us obtain this, this Saren. And it's really cool because this works beautifully, even though this is a very old unit. This, is, this unit's about 15 years old. But what this does, once you hit go, this will actually rotate and measure this diamond and give you the most accurate measurements you can imagine. And it makes cut grading of diamonds very easy because you get all the proportions and everything else right here. And if you hit the right button on the unit, you'll even get the girdle you can see down towards the bottom here. You've got the girdle of the stone, the measurements, you've got all the measurements of the stone. You can even rotate it and it will give you the proportioning that goes along with that. So this is a very important thing to have if you can get one for your lab or office because it's something that will be um, invaluable to you and save you a tremendous amount of time when you're doing proportion grading and doing cut grading. So that's gonna be something that I wanted you to see because we had the sarin, in fact, you can see it, the little orange thing right over here, the little orange, that's what they helped us get. And uh, we certainly appreciate them. And we are looking, I am looking to get to Albuquerque uh, and, and, and meet up with them. Anyway, let's let's go to the next thing. We've, we've got cut, let's go to color now. And, and what we want to do is take a look at color and what we're gonna do with it. And I'm looking over here because I got notes because we have so much going on here at, at once. I've got a little demonstration on color that I want you to see. And I think it will make it very easy to understand once you see this. Uh, the, the first thing we're gonna do is, is how do you make a color grading tray? And that's going to be the first thing we're going to look at because some people will say, you know, well, I, gee, I can't afford all this heavy equipment. Well, you don't always need expensive equipment. Sometimes you can just go with what you got. Here's a little trick of the trade I want to share with you about how to make a cost-effective diamond grading tray. Uh, I've seen these used in diamond grading offices from Dallas to L.A. to New York. Just take a regular business card. And you take this business card, as, you, as I'm doing mine here, and you simply fold it in half. There's two or three folds we're going to have to do with it, but you simply fold it in half first. And then you fold it again in quarters from the edges, like you see here. And I'm going to make another fold to go over here. And, and you've got a tray, but you want to finish out the edges to make sure you can put diamonds on here and they don't slide out the end. So you, you, you crank up a little side like this on the end right in this corner and you've got a great little tray here that you can put diamonds on in your desk you don't have to worry about them sliding around sliding off your desk you can also be able to put them table down to do color grading i made this one in advance and this is a this is a, a cz master set that i have and you can see you can slide this thing around and you're not going to lose your stones but you can very easily see the various body colors on this camera. It's not as obviously easy to do diamond grading uh, on this camera, but this is a CZ master set that I've had for years that I match up to my diamond master set that does very well. And this is a great little diamond grading tray that uh, you can make just from a business card. And it's a very professional thing to do. A lot of professionals use it. Okay, that's your tray. That's that's where you can set your tray. Now, the other thing about it is you can have, you know, a master diamond color set. Those are very expensive and hard to get. You can also use CZ sets. 
And that can be something that makes the diamond color grading easier for you. And to be honest with you, I have, I have both. We obviously have both in here. We have a, a master diamond set that you're gonna see in just a minute. And we also have CZ sets, a couple of them I've owned for 20 years. People worry about, well, they fade. Well, these don't fade if you keep them in a the container, if you keep them closed, keep them out of the light for UV or anything else. I have CZ sets that I can actually match to our master AGS master certified diamonds and they match spot on, but we do take care of them. And that's something you need to do. This is a demonstration of actual color grading. And I want to show you this because not only do you see the actual certified diamond set, but you're gonna see a case that I actually worked on and said, and it had involved with EGL again, but it was EGL USA. But it was uh, a grading that I did for one of the cases for which I'm expert witness, but it's a demonstration of how color grading is done. And it'll just kind of give you a good idea about how this goes. So let me get over to that point. This is a rather graphic demonstration of diamond color. You'll notice that it goes all the way from the D on the left down to the Z. Uh, the, this, of course, is uh, simply a rendering on photographs, but it gives you an idea about how the colors will change as we go down the scale. The GIA scale, which was developed in the U.S. and used pretty much worldwide, will run from a D to a Z. And you'll notice the DEF is colorless. The G through J is near colorless. These are face up, of course, and the faint yellow on down to the very light yellow and light yellow. These color grades are on a color of yellows. But there are master sets. Here you see the actual master color diamond set that we have here in the ISG office that we use to grade diamonds for our courses. And even though that these are third carat diamonds, they can be used to actually grade larger ones. This is uh, a case you're looking at right here. This is an actual litigation, a case that I handled in the U.S. state of Florida. And this is a two and a half carat diamond that was color graded using our master color set that has been certified. So whether you're using diamonds and also CZ color sets can also work, you be able to do proper color grading if you have a master set of stones to be able to work with. Now, let's talk about one thing. There is an electronic type of color grader. I have a lot of people ask, you know, well, in this day and age, is, is there something that can machine color? Well, yes, there has. There has been for a long time to do machine color grading. The problem is, is calibration. In other words, I have a, a colorimeter here or some other unit that will color grade a diamond electronically. What says that that unit is calibrated exactly to what the next unit is? Pretty soon you got all these units and all these different offices. And if they're not all calibrated to the exact same, it's not gonna matter. So use your eyes in a master set because you're gonna come closer to that and you'd be more assured of what's going on and once they get a standardization in the colorimeters or some of the other technology, I think it'll be great. But right now, we're, we're putting too much on the electronics and too much on somebody else grading and not being able to grade ourselves and have that level of professionalism to be able to grade ourselves. So spend some time and study on this and, and get a master set. If you get a CZ master set, that's totally fine. And that will be good. Now, let's go next to clarity grading, because that's the third of the, th of, of the three. And with the American Gem Society, those of you all that are AGS, you know it's a triple zero, 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 zero. That's top of the line. It's cut, color, clarity. And that's what this is all about. Clarity is the, I won't say least important, it's the third in the line of importance. Because clarity is the point that if you can't see it with your unaided eye, what does it mean? In other words, if it's a VS2 or a VVS1, you have to have a microscope to tell the difference. So the, there is a concept there that, you know, the clarity does not make nearly as much impact as cut. And that is a correct concept. And what we're going to do with this, we're going to look at some actual guidelines of what constitutes the, the, the various levels of VS1, VS2, VS3. Those are all what GIA invented. But the concept of what a definition of a VS2 or an SI1 is, there is no standard, but I'm going to show you a guide based on the fact that I've studied in London. I've got my GIA. I've got the AGS. We, I've put these together and created a guideline that will help you when you're grading diamonds, be able to be in a mainstream grading concept for all of these 
areas, all, all of these different teaching areas. So there's no one guide that I can give you that's gonna be a panacea for everything. But if you follow these, it's going to let, let your grading of diamonds fall very much in line to the mainstream of what's acceptable in the industry. And that's what's gonna be important. Let's start out taking a look at these. We're gonna start with, with flawless. And I've written this here, I'm gonna read it here because we will have visitors on this YouTube channel that will be translating this into other languages. And I try to be cognizant of that. I'm gonna read it because they'll be able to translate it. Plus we'll just reinforce the concept here for you. No visible inclusions under 10 power magnification when carefully observed by a professionally trained diamond grader. And that means exactly what it says. Somebody that's really good at doing it looks for a long time and finds nothing. Now, the difference between that and internally flawless is that with an internally flawless, there's nothing inside the stone. It's the same standard. It's, it's the same guideline, I should say. But there's a, maybe a little ding, a little extra facet or something on the surface of the stone, but nothing inside. And that's where you get internally flawless. The next is the VVS 1 and 2. VVS 1 has minor inclusions that take time to find and they're located on the outer edge of the stone. Whereas VVS2 has very minor inclusions that take time to find, but they're located more towards the star facet or towards the table, but they're very tiny. They take a long time to see, but where they're located from the outer part of the stone to the closer to the table makes that determination. The next one is VS1, VS2. VS1 has inclusions, but they take time to find but they're located around the outer edge. And it doesn't take as long to find the VS1 as it does the VVS. That's your difference is how long it's take to find it. And VVS2 is just the same. It's the same inclusions, but they're gonna be located closer to the table. And the reason being that the closer they are to the table, the more they may impact the beauty of the stone. So the ones that are out closer to the girdle are not, they're hard to find. And so that's the difference when a VS1, VS2. SI1, SI2, the same guideline basics. The clarity has inclusions that are spotted immediately under a 10 power magnification. And of course, diamonds should be graded under 10 power magnification. Some people crank it up to 60 power or something to see if they can see anything and then back away from it to see if they can still see it. But that's really not the way to do it. They should be under a 10 power magnification. But they're located around the outer edges of the diamond and they're not visible without 10 power magnification. As soon as you look at it with the loop, you see it. But without the loop, you really can't see it. That's what makes the SI1. And the SI2, the clarity has inclusions that are spotted, but they're more towards the center of the diamond. In other words, as soon as you put a 10 power loop on it, you can see it and it's more towards the center of the diamond, the table. So it's a little more visible. And then we get into the I1 through I3. Now, I will just mention here, do not use SI3. Do not use SI3 as a grade. That's not an acceptable grade. And even though EGL and some others use it, it's it, we'll go into that when we get into advanced diamond grading sometime. But the important part here, I1 has inclusions that are visible to the naked eye 12 inches away. In other words, if you hold the diamond out 12 inches, you can see it without magnification. But it doesn't really take away from the beauty or the durability of the stone. In other words, you can see it, but it's not really making it ugly. I2, the same thing, but the inclusions affect either the beauty or the durability of the stone. With an I2 diamond, you have an inclusion you can see with the unaided eye, and it really kind of takes away from the beauty of the stone. Or it may be an inclusion that's not that bad as far as seeing it, but it's a fracture or something that takes away from the durability. And then in I3, you've got a, you, you, I3 is just nasty. I mean, it's, it's a, I, I bad word used for diamond grading, but honestly, you have inclusions in the stone that affect both the beauty and the durability of the diamond, and they're easily seen with the unaided eye. And that's what it's all about. And this is, a, this is another little definition of that to kind of give you an idea between the I1, I2, and I3, because the I1, you can see fairly easily without magnification, but it's not really messing up the stone. I2, once again, it's either durability or beauty. And then I3, it's both durability and beauty of the stone. And that's going to be an important part of this. Now, there are 
various, uh, you know, grading scales that some people, the AGS uses a, a zero through 10. There's various grading scales. This is, of course, the GIA scale we're using. The AGS has a wonderful scale. Just depending on where you're studying, it will determine what, which one you need to use. Okay, now before we, before we end this, there's a couple more things that I want to cover with you just to let you know what's happening. And, and there's some other grading things like, you know, polish and symmetry and things that you'll get into when you get into formal diamond grading. But I want to talk just a minute about fluorescence because fluorescence has become very important. There's a, a lot of places that are dealing with fluorescence and some people are making a big thing out of it. Some people are not. When I was first starting in this business, what, 50 years ago, the most, the, the most desired diamond is a blue-white. They call it a blue-white diamond. And that was like the ultimate. And it was a white diamond, a colorless diamond, but it had a tinge of fluorescence of blue in it. And it caused a blue-white color. And that was it. Of course, that's not the case anymore. But that's why this issue of fluorescence can change. And I want to give you some examples of fluorescence just to give you some ideas of what, what the impact can be. This is a scale, this is your basic scale of fluorescence. And, and you've got five divisions here. So a lot of people use four. We basically use four, which is non faint, medium, and strong. And that's usually gonna be what you need. Very strong, you'll also have, but it's, it's really a bright headlight when you're looking at it. What we've done here is taken a lineup of diamonds. This is a, a lineup of diamonds we have here in the ISG lab and put them under the UV light. And of course, this can vary some between long wave and short wave. But we use long wave here just simply because these diamonds happen to respond very quickly to them. And you can see you've got a, a variety of reactions to the fluorescence. And if we get in closer to these, you can actually see that you've got very strong here on the, on, on the right side, you've got medium, which it's, you can see the difference between strong and medium. The medium you can see through a little bit, the strong you can't see through at all. The faint, you're getting a, you're getting a faint reaction to this, but you gotta be very careful because if you look back over towards the right where it's inert, this diamond is actually not reacting. It is reflecting the fluorescent light. And a lot of people will see this and see the reflection of the light and, and think, oh, that's a reaction. It's not a reaction. Look at the one next to it. That's fluorescence. This one is inert, but it happens to be reflecting that fluorescent light that's coming through with the long wave. So you have to be careful of that when you're grading fluorescence in a diamond because it can make a big difference. But this little lineup here has all four of the grades that we use, which I think have always been you know, quite interesting. Okay, just a couple more things on this, then, then, then I'm gonna let you go because there's so much to, to share with you. It's a lot of fun. Um, I wanna talk to you about the gem print. And, and the gem print is something that you may run into because the gem print is a very unique technology that allows us to fingerprint a diamond. And I bring this up because I think it's very important as an insurance adjuster, that, that I handle high value jewelry claims. I run across gem print all the time. Truth be known in the mid eighties or so when gem print first came out, I was a rep for gem print. I actually went to gem shows for gem print. So I got a really good education into the technology of gem print. And what it is is you put a laser into a diamond and then record the, the reflections of that laser and it creates a fingerprint. And it's rather amazing to see. I want to show you a little demonstration. I actually set up, because the technology you can create in an office, which is what I've done here, because I have the lasers and things to do it. You shouldn't do this at home, because don't mess with lasers and things with gemology in your office or anywhere, because unless you're really careful with it and know what you're doing, you could really blind yourself out. And you don't want to do that. But I, I created this one just for this journey through gemology to demonstrate to you what a gem print is and how gem print can actually serve as an identifier for diamonds. If you lose a diamond and you're not sure that it's yours when you get it recovered, you can get a gem print on it. And this is how this is going to work. What we will do, this is the setup right here. And, and what this is, this is a laser. I put it on this little wooden box and I drilled a hole where the laser goes through this piece of paper. In the foreground there, you can see that's a cubic zirconia on a stone holder on another piece of, actually it's on a box 
we create things however we need to here. Anyway, and, and the next step in this obviously is to turn this around so that the laser's pointing straight into the CZ and you can all already see some of the reflections on the white paper. When we turn the, the light off, bingo, where those reflections hit on the white paper becomes an identifier of the particular stone. Now, I'm gonna show you something different about this and I'm gonna tell you a little history about this that most people don't know about a gem print. And that's when we look at this one. This is another one. This happens to be a diamond. Now, there is a big difference and this is where the history of this comes in. The gem print was not originally invented to create a gem print, an identifier foot, or foot, excuse me, fingerprint of a diamond. It was identified to be able to separate CZ and natural diamond. And it will do so. The laser, you can actually separate a CZ and a natural diamond with a laser if you know what to look for. And here's where it is. If you'll notice here, when you're seeing this pattern, this is very much circular. It's in this particular shot with the circles in here, you can kind of see how these are circled out. Whereas when we go back to the diamond, they're straight lines. And it's because of the way this laser is interacting with the diamond as compared to the CZ and with the facets. And you really get to see it better when you put the two together. On the, on the left is the diamond, the right is the CZ. And when you look at the CZ in this size, you can see how you get the circular patterns, particularly there in the center, you get the circular patterns, whereas the diamond has straight lines. The original purpose of the gem print was to be able to do that exact same thing. But they also found that those reflections on the left side with the diamond, each diamond is different. Each diamond's reflections is different, just like a fingerprint. And they can identify, you can pull one diamond out of a hundred, out of a thousand others that have been gem printed before it went in. And you can pick that diamond back out with a gem print. It, it's, it's a technology that has come a long way since I was working with them because we had to use Polaroid shots and, and have Polaroid photographs to try to compare. Nowadays, of course, it's all digital. But this is just an amazing technology that is out there. And as part of the diamond grading, you may run across hearing about gem print. And I wanted to tell you all what it is. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about diamond grading, and this is something that is for jewelry stores and dealers and everyone, because I know that there's a lot of people in this industry. In fact, the majority of this industry uses the major grading labs. And the idea about a certified diamond, a certified GIA, GI certified, EGL certified, IGI certified diamond. The problem is that you need to understand about this. And we're going to go further into this because I'm going to do a, a journey through gemology on the litigation of labs. Because I've been involved with a lot of litigation in, involving the big major gem labs. And you'll be surprised how this turns out. But I want to show you just a couple of quick slides here that will probably drive this on home. And that's when we look at the diamond grading. It's interesting because first thing, it's amazing that we're certifying, and I say certifying, that's a bad word, I just said it was, but, but we're getting diamond grading reports on 17 point diamonds. These are, these are Melly stuff. And it's astounding in the industry these days that we're sending 17 point diamonds to the GIA for grading because people are so caught up in these certificates. The thing is, if you get into the certificates, this is from the IGI. I can show you this on every one. If you'll notice the advertising, it's the IGI certifies the widest variety of gemstones and jewelry in more corners of the world than any other organization. You hear these labs tout their services, that they're the most accurate. They're the ones you can trust. You can trust everything to their grading. But look at the second paragraph on this one. Neither IGI nor any of its employees or agents shall have any liability for any losses, damage, cost, or expense resulting or caused by any error or, or omission in the report. So, it, it, you know, in other words, what you have is major labs touting their diamond grading reports. You don't have to do diamond grading because we'll do it for you. You can trust us. We have the most accurate, we have the best labs, we have the best diamond graders, and we have the best services to certify your diamonds for you. And sometimes they say it because IGI just said certified. But in reality, if you look at the small print on the back, it says, hey, if we have errors and omissions, not our fault. If we make a mistake, not our fault. And here's the problem we're gonna talk about in an upcoming 
journey through gemology. When the labs make mistakes, you pay for them. I've been involved and I'm going to have case law when we do this. $100,000 diamond sales. GIA had made, it, made a mistake, a huge mistake. They wrote a letter that admitted they made the mistake. And then they never bothered to show up in court and they were never held liable for it. But the jewelers involved put out about $100,000 in legal fees trying to get the dispute taken care of because, because of this. And the actual, the, the actual binding me arbitration admitted that the GIA was responsible, but they weren't held responsible. This is, this is why it is so important for everyone to learn diamond grading for yourself. So you can catch errors in labs. It's okay to use the major labs. They're good to have. Quite frankly, they serve a good purpose. But if you're a dealer and all you do is just use that certificate and you don't try to do any uh, grading of your own and you're not able to verify what's on that report before you give it to your customer, you're going to be responsible for all the errors there. And that's why the information like what has been in this journey through gemology is important for everyone because it gives you the opportunity not only to grade diamonds for yourself, but to double check the diamonds that you get from elsewhere with certificates from elsewhere to make sure they're what they're supposed to be before you give them to your client. And that's what this is all about. I hope you've enjoyed this session of the Journey Through Gemology. We've got some more coming up that I think will be fun and important, and it'll have a lot of important information to help you do more accurate business and create more revenue streams. I'm Robert James. Thank you for being with me.